Hi all, this is the Makehaven badging video for MIG welding. This is the welding area uh, at Makehaven. As you can see, there are protective screens around. These screens block out some of the dangerous UV radiation that comes off when you're welding. The UV is the same coming from the sun. It can burn your skin, and it can also give you a, like a sunburn on your eyes. Uh, so it's really important to protect yourself, but these shields are protect passers-by. So it's important to let people know in the area that you're gonna be welding so that they aren't looking at it inadvertently, but then these screens are also for protecting their eyes. We're gonna go from top to bottom on, on MIG welding. Uh, however, this is gonna cover safety, uh, how to protect yourself as well as the equipment. This is not gonna make you a master welder. We'll have classes in the future that can go over some of the finer details. So welding is when you're putting two pieces of metal together and doing so in general, though not always, by melting the two pieces of metal. There are a lot of different kinds of welding certainly hundreds, but for our purposes, it's, it's when the two pieces of metal melt. There's like stir welding, doesn't matter. People can argue about that, it's not for now. Um, MIG welding stands for metal inert gas. The metal is pretty obvious. The inert gas means that when the metal is molten, when you've actually melted it, it reacts with the oxygen in the air, which you don't want. And so what you do is there's an inert gas that blows around the metal when it's molten that protects it from the oxygen in the air so that it is a good strong piece of metal once it cools down and re-solidifies. There are a lot of different names for all the different kinds of welding. So another uh, name for MIG that you might hear is GMAW, GMAW, or gas metal arc welding. The gas we covered, the metal we covered. Arc is when you, is a, any kind of welding where it uses electricity to make a really powerful spark effectively between an electrode and your work. So whether that's with stick or TIG or MIG, even plasma, there is an arc being created and that arc produces a lot of heat in your material and also a lot of light. So that is where a lot of the danger comes from. Something else is that in a MIG machine, so we can come over here and actually look at the machine, you can also run something called flux core. So flux core is sometimes thought of as totally different than MIG for a few reasons. Um, one is that it doesn't require a tank of gas. So if you're out in a field somewhere dragging this thing around, big pain in the butt versus just carrying this thing. The idea is that this tank of gas provides a shield around the molten metal, which is great, but sometimes you don't want to carry that tank around. So instead, you have flux core. Flux, same as when you're soldering, is a chemical that helps to protect from the oxygen when you are welding, when it's molten. So uh, it can also help with, with other properties. So that is where the flux is built in, so it doesn't actually need the additional inert gas. It creates a cloud of gas around the weld on its own. So you can imagine that being pretty helpful. We do have a spool of that here, and we'll touch briefly on how you would use that. Technically, it's not MIG because there's no inert gas, but it, it does use the same machine. So this particular gas is a mixture of argon, which is a noble gas that is very unreactive, non-reactive, and carbon dioxide. So 75% and 25%. And that is what is shielding the weld. That's sort of the optimal shielding gas uh, for steels. When you start doing other metals, you want other gases. So here at Makehaven, we have sort of the, the basic normal setup that most people are gonna want. The option is available to you if you wanna go out and buy your own gases and your own wire. Speak to a facilitator to make sure everything is safe and, and you know everything is being done in a safe manner. All tanks need to be well secured to the wall, so we need to make sure to have a, um, either you know, you're securing it safely in your own space or it's secured safely on the wall. Um, so we'll, we'll touch on that briefly as well. In general, like in this basic setup, when you come into Makehaven and when you're doing the badging, the, this setup is for welding mild steels. This is an example of that. This is square tube stock that is popular when you're doing legs on a table 
for example here. Inside this machine, it's doing a few things. One, it's taking the AC electricity from the wall, alternating current, where the electricity is going up, down, up, down, up, down, and converting it to DC, direct current. So that's just one straight line. And that's nice because when you're welding, you don't want the electricity to be bouncing back and forth. That would make your arc jump all over the place. You just want one continuous spark or arc. Um, there are a few exceptions, but not in MIG. MIG is only DC. But then it gets a little more complicated because you can have DC electrode positive or DC electronegative. In general, you want electrode positive. Uh, sometimes it used, used to be called reverse uh, welding or reverse polarity. DC EP is now what it's most often called. And the idea there is that it's actually the electrons are coming from the material, from your work, and they're then concentrating around that point in the material, heating up, heating up, and then coming into your electrode. Uh, in straight polarity, the electricity is coming from your electrode and then going into a broad area in your work, wherever it can contact. So that creates a less concentrated uh, heat, like the, the, the electricity is going through that metal and creating heat from resistance. Um, so in that orientation, it's not penetrating quite as deeply. So in general, we like DC electrode positive or reverse polarity. You can, however, swap those in there. And again, we'll, we'll touch on that briefly. So in terms of just the anatomy of what's going on here, so we know what we're working with, because that's important. This is fairly dangerous. This is the gas. We covered what uh, this particular gas is. Um, the, the gas is stored at a very high pressure, so it needs to be con treated with respect. Uh, it should never be dropped. You can imagine if it were to get dropped and this part gets knocked off, this is just a missile that will launch through walls. See, these are brass fittings. Brass is relatively soft, so it can squeeze into other fittings and, and make a good snug fit without any Teflon in general. That does also mean you can't crank on these fittings. You'll, you'll strip them out pretty easily. So you just want to get them nice and snug. Uh, this, there are two gauges on here. This one is indicating the pressure in the tank once this is open, once the, the tank has actually been opened. Um, this, if you turn it counter, like left, counterclockwise, it'll loosen it and let the ga gas out. And this will show you the pressure left. Once you start getting really low, you should stop using it um, you know, once that needle is, so the red is PSI, which is what we're gonna deal with. Once you're at, you know, 100, you should probably turn it off and post on Slack, tell a facilitator so we can go and replace the tank, get it refilled. Um, so this is indicating pressure in the tank. Pressure is how much force it's pushing here with. This is not reading pressure, this is reading flow. So there's a little steel ball in there, which you can probably see. And as the gas starts flowing, it lifts that ball up. And so this is a flow meter. So this is saying at any given moment how much gas is flowing. Right now the whole thing's off, so no gas is flowing. I marked with a Sharpie right here how, where you want that ball to sit when you're welding. So you want that ball to sit around 25. This is measuring in cubic feet per hour. So you want about 25 cubic feet per hour. That's why, where you want that ball to sit. And this knob here controls how much that gas is going to be able to flow. Um, so right now, I'll bet it's set at a pretty good place. When you're done with any kind of welding that involves a gas, you want to purge the line. So this is open so that gas was allowed to come out. This is obviously closed. It's very important when you're done that all the tanks are closed so that the gas doesn't just escape and blow away. And that would be very expensive and potentially dangerous to people. So then it comes through the hose and it goes into the machine. So for all, all these gas fittings, we want to make sure there are no leaks. That's pretty important. Um, this isn't a terribly dangerous gas, but it's still expensive and we want to make sure it isn't leaking. So I'm going to show you over here. This is where a spray bottle of soapy water is kept. So what we're going to do is I'm going to open this valve. Uh, and for most gases, you want to open them up all the way. You want to open them slowly at first. You don't want to just crank it open. We're going to open it slowly so that needle is coming up nice and easy, not whacking open. More, more, all right. Now I'm gonna open it all the way. And that's just because sometimes if you leave a valve in the middle position, it can leak a little bit. So we're gonna open you all the way up so it's nice and snug. And I'm just gonna spray the soapy water. You don't need to do this anytime except if you suspect that there's a leak. 
and you want to find it, or if you're changing fittings out. Say we got a new tank, we put it in, then you need to make sure there are no leaks. Um, and here we can see there are no leaks. The way you would tell is it would be foaming. F it, it makes foam if there's a little leak, and it makes big, big bubbles if you are, this is just dish soap, if, uh, if there's a bigger leak. So here we can see it's all, all nice and snug. Um, and right now there's, there's a whole lot of pressure. So there's almost 2,000 pounds per square inch in this tank. So these fittings are doing a good job of holding it. So that's great. I'm gonna put this back. All right, so now let's see. We, we're at the machine. Let's open it up to see the inside. We just oop, lift this here. And there's a, a few things that are important. This is the spool of wire. So this is general steel um, welding wire. A few important things to notice are that its size is 30 thou or 0 0.030 inches. And so you just need to make sure that the other pieces in this setup align with that number. And then it goes through this. This is pretty similar to a 3D printer. If you're familiar with, with that, it's clamping down on that wire and feeding it. So this machine is actively pulling this spool of metal and squirting it out the end. And it's also giving it electricity. So here you can see these two are determining where the electricity is going. So if you can read this label here, it's saying the DC electrode negative is for flux core wire, polarity switch settings. So you would have no gas and you would have that work clamp going to positive at the top and then the gun, the torch, going to the negative on the bottom. Versus here, it's swapped. So we can see here that the red is going to the torch, which is good. This, uh, the red positive is going to the torch and with gas. And then here, the bottom one, the black, going to the work clamp is at negative. So that's for MIG, DC electrode positive. So that's all hunky-dory. If you were switching over to DC electrode negative for some reason, you need to make sure to swap those and then please put them back when you're done because no one is gonna think to check that. There are some instructions here underneath for setting this clamping pressure um, for different size wires. You might need to swap this. There are two grooves in this roller, so you need to make sure it's matching the right wire size. So if you were switching out material, those are things you need to check uh, and make sure to go over that with a facilitator just to make sure that you're doing it properly. Most times when you buy wire, it's gonna come in a spool about this size. Obviously very different size. Um, and this is actually flux core. So what you would do is take this wing nut out, remove this, and then there's a, an adapter on here for this big wheel. You would just take that off and put the small wheel on. It's important to make sure there are no twists. Same as on a 3D printer, if, if this wire is twisted up, it's not gonna be able to come out. In addition, let's say you wanted to do aluminum, it would be a good idea. So inside this tube, is a lining for the wire to run through. Um, aluminum is very difficult to weld this way because aluminum is so soft that it'll get kinked up in this, uh, in this tube. So in general, people use something called a spool gun, which holds this spool of aluminum right in your hand while you're, whoa, sorry, while you're welding. Um, you can try to do it with this. You just need to make sure to keep this hose as straight as possible so it doesn't get all kinked up inside. So there's a chart here that I've also copied and put up on the wall that we'll, we'll look at in a minute. This just has some good information on it. For steel, you wanna use just solid wire type. Um, this is the only difference here is the type of gas. So we're using this combination of argon and CO2, DC electrode positive. We're using 0 0.030 wire diameter. And then it's saying that uh, the thinnest material we can do with that is 20 gauge, uh, a voltage setting of two, which we'll get to in a minute, and a wire feed of two to three. So this is just a chart that's telling you, based on the thickness of your material, what the material is, what gases, et cetera, um, what the voltage is and what wire feed you should be using. And it also notes up at the top that some things, like how clean your material is, uh, the voltage, whatnot, can affect these settings. These are recommended starting settings, which are great, but just, just suggestions. So bear that in mind. There are also some other good notes to read on there. All right, so now we're at the front of the machine, and let's start with the, the indicators and whatnot on the front. On-off switch, pretty straightforward. 
And then these are the two big ones, wire feed and voltage. So voltage controls how much electricity is getting pumped into your material. Um, right now it's set to four, so that's just as much as possible. Um, this is a MIG 135, which means it's capable of 135 amps of electricity. So volts is how badly the electricity wants to go from one side to the other, and amps is how much electricity is flowing. So this, the chart on the side will show you, you know, the thickest material it could potentially do of different types. This is a relatively small machine, you know, versus like a 300 amp machine. So, you know, you, you can't do crazy thick material. You would have to put a bevel, so you could take two pieces of metal and, and put a bevel on them and then start at the bottom or the root and work your way up. And that would be how you would do thicker material. So as these, these are two things that you need to balance. The wire feed is how quickly that thing is squirting out the, the metal, the electrodes. The metal is actually what's conducting the electricity and coming out the end. So there's two things coming through this hose, the gas as well, or actually three, the gas, the electricity, and that wire. So those are the settings on the front, and you can use the chart to get a sense of where to start with that, and we'll, we'll cover a bit of more of that as we get there. All right, so now we'll look at these two wires coming out of the front. So this is the, the torch or the gun, sometimes it's called a stinger. Uh, this is just to help focus the gas. So we can take this off to see what's going on on the inside. So the gas comes out of these holes and then gets blown around your material. And then this is a little contact tip. Um, and you just wanna make sure it's clean. So right now it's a little sooty on the front. So we'll just try to clean that up a little bit. Um, eventually it might get totally eroded. So there are actually a bunch more. These shelves are organized by the type of welding you're doing. So Meg is right here. These are a whole bunch of contact tips. These are actually 0 0.035. So these are a little big for what we're doing here. You know, we'll wanna get some others that are the appropriate size. And I'm just gonna grab a brush here and just clean that off a little bit. It doesn't really need to be perfect. Then what you could also do is uh, by the oxyacetylene, we have a tip cleaner, so you could clean that out as well, but it looks pretty good to me. Um, it's important you do that so that you have good electrical conductivity. So we're gonna take this, put it back in. If you were feeding a new spool of wire, you would wanna take this out and let the wire come all the way out and then manually feed it to make sure you get right in the hole. I'm gonna tighten that up. Just needs to be snug, nothing crazy. Put this guy on. Okay. And there's also, so this is a pretty spattery process, MIG welding versus something like TIG, which people consider to be a little finer and less, less dirty. Um, so there's a, a bunch of, of spatter that has gotten up in, inside of here. So these are pliers that are made specifically for MIG welding. And you can take them, put them in there, and just kind of go around a bit, and that'll help knock out some of the slag and just chunks of metal that have gotten stuck up in there. So it helps, but that's important so that it helps the air flow smoothly. Once they get it's all clogged up, your air, the gas is gonna be going very nicely. All right, so we covered that. And now there is this. Some people call it the ground clamp. Other people get all in a tizzy when they call it a ground clamp because if you're doing electrode positive, then the electricity is actually coming from here. So this is, the, it's called a work clamp. This is what clamps on your work. The reason uh, for the welding table, it's made out of metal, is because if you're welding something, you can have it sitting on here, especially if it's clamped, and then you just clamp onto the table because this whole thing is clean and conductive. So this, in general, you want to clamp onto your work if it's possible, but if it's not, you want to just make sure there's a good connection between the two, so you would clamp this down. The reason is, obviously, you should never have bare skin. We'll get to that soon. But it, let's say your shirt was wet, you were sweating, it was hot, and you lean your arm on the table, you could get a shock because that electricity now can go through you more easily than the work if this isn't good clean and, and a good connection. So that's why, in general, you do want to clamp right to your work. In terms of the electricity, you do want to make sure that it has a good electrical connection. The way you can do that is by making sure it's clean. So you grab a brush and wipe off, uh, you know, whatever. When you, when you buy this kind of square tubing, um, it's pretty dirty. You know, these gloves are this color from carrying the steel. So, you know, bear that in mind. It's not clean to start with. So you can do is grab a brush. The brushes are labeled for what they're for. 
So this says steel, these say aluminum. Those are just the two most common kinds of metal. We do have other brushes you can use. The reason is you don't want to get little flakes of aluminum. So this brush, just to be clear, isn't made out of aluminum. It's made out of stainless steel, um, but it's for brushing aluminum. So you don't want those flakes of aluminum to get onto your steel, and you don't want flakes of steel to get onto your aluminum. So you keep them separate. So this is steel. So you just clean this off, and it gets nice and shiny. They, when they manufacture the steel, they cover it in um, oil so that it doesn't rust. This has obviously gotten its oil cleaned off of it. So that's good. We're just going to be getting these surfaces. And then the next step is using a degreaser, like Simple Green. And this just cuts through the oil. So you just spray some of that on as I get the table wet. I just said it was not good. And that just takes the oil off, so now you have a nice clean surface to weld. And in case this wasn't clear, the, the welding, when, when you're welding, it's making a short circuit. And that short circuit, if you've ever seen one, makes, it can start fires. It's in general a bad thing. We have circuit breakers to stop it, but this is an instance where we want it. We're using that so short circuit to make a lot of heat. Um, cool. So now we're going to talk about safety. This is obviously of paramount importance, so we're going to spend a minute on it. One that we covered already is the ultraviolet rays. That can burn your skin, it can burn your eyes, burn other people's eyes. Uh, it's, it's something you need to take very seriously. There's no, there's no like flipping up your helmet and trying it for a minute. Um, it, it'll cause what's called welder's flash, um, which is where you get a sunburn on your eyes. It's excruciating. It's been, I've heard it described as having sand and salt just rubbed in your eyes. Um, you don't want that. And, and you can see old welders whose eyes are all kinds of messed up from having welded irresponsibly with regard to the UV. There's also infrared, which is how we experience heat through light. Um, so you need to protect your skin from, from the literal heat. Something like WIT, MIG, the welding process, creates a lot of heat. Uh, you need to wear pretty hefty gloves to protect yourself from that. Another thing is that the light, the ultraviolet, is dangerous even just in your peripheral vision. So let's, you know, if you're walking by, if you, you know, you, you just need to be very mindful of not catching that arc in your eye. Uh, in general, to be considerate to other people, we'll want to close up the shields around us and weld on this side so that your back is to other people and your body is protecting them from the, the rays. So there are a bunch of different types of gloves. Um, they're living right here. These are our, our TIG gloves, generally, so they're really thin. With TIG, you want to be as dexterous as possible and have fine control because you're feeding wire. And, um, so that's what, what these are for. You know, you can use them for other purposes. These are the other end of the spectrum. These are super heavy duty, mostly for, for stick welding. Um, so these give you very little dexterity, but could also be valuable. And then I'll grab another pair for MIG, which is kind of in the middle. Something that is very important is that anything you're wearing, be they gloves, shirt, pants, hat, you name it, it can't be made of synthetic materials. So it can't be polyester, nylon, whatever. If the sparks hit those, it'll just melt, which is maybe worse than bare skin because then it's this nasty plasticky material melted onto your skin. Um, so you can't just grab normal work gloves. They do need to be leather, Kevlar, something that is not gonna melt. In terms of clothing, it needs to be wool or cotton. Cannot, cannot be synthetic. So just need to, you know, you can't just throw a hoodie on uh, unless you're very sure that it is a 100% cotton hoodie. So this, you know, isn't always intuitive to people. Molten metal is very hot. You, you are pumping it a huge amount of heat into something. So if, when we weld these together, these pieces of metal are gonna be super hot. So hot you can't, you do not wanna pick them up with your gloves because what will happen is those gloves will get super hot. You won't feel it for a minute. And then even after you put those down, the heat will radiate through the gloves and start burning your hands while you're not even touching them anymore. Um, so you really want to just let, you know, hot things just sit. You don't want to, you, don't, you can hold it with pliers. So that's why we have those, the pliers. You can grab them, put them, do whatever you want. So you can use the pliers to dunk it in water. You don't want to be leaning on things. Uh, you know, when you're using a torch, you're not, waving it around, there's like the heat is very consequential. In terms of the safety gear, we can come over here because it's put on the outside. We can just start from one end and go to the other. So these are jackets, these are welders jackets. They go all the way up to your neck. Um, they are obviously flame resistant, um, different sizes, small through large. 
Uh, we have caps. So just a baseball cap is probably going to have synthetic material in it, as well as it won't cover your ears. Getting a piece of slag in your ear, worlds of not fun. You get to listen to your skin burning, as well as experiencing it. You really want your ears covered. Um, and if the mask isn't doing that, which it might, then you really want a cap. So what a mask won't do is covering the top and back of your head and the back of your neck. And when you're welding, sometimes that splatter is coming back up and over. And you may not feel it for a minute. Well, if you have thick hair, but it'll get down, and then you'll feel it, and it will be a lot of not fun. So these caps go on, and they're like reverse baseball caps. So they, they don't go forwards. That wouldn't be helpful. They go backwards. And this bill is to protect the back of your neck. So you're like this. They protect your ears and go back to protect back here. Um, ear protection isn't super necessary for MIG welding. Uh, and in general, you want ear plugs because trying to wear ear protection and a mask is pretty difficult. So now we'll get to masks. There are a few different styles. The best style comes with two features. One is it dims automatically, um, meaning you, you don't need to lift it up and down to change, to, to be able to see and not see, because that would require you getting set up and then lowering the mask and then welding blind for a second. Um, what these do is they have a sensor that detects when you've started welding, and in a flash of a second, they turn the dimming on so that you don't get blinded. Um, and this, the second really cool feature is that you can change the amount of shade that they have. So here, it's the maximum. It's, it's set to 13 when we're at weld. Um, and you could bring it all the way down to 5. So 5, as we'll see in a minute, would be good for brazing with an oxyacetylene torch versus you know, stick welding with a, with a lot of current. Would, you would want all the way up to 13. The two other knobs here are sensitivity. So let's say you were welding out in the sun. The sun's really bright, and it might be triggering this all the time. And you'd be like, no, I need to be able to see. So then you would turn the sensitivity down. In here, compared to the sun, the lights aren't very bright. So you just leave the sensitivity at 100, or high. Uh, and then there's delay. So what delay does is after you're done welding, it will keep the dimness on. Because even that molten metal, once you're done welding, is still very bright. So it'll give you a few seconds to let that cool down before bringing before letting you see again, effectively. And then there's this little slider. Uh, weld is at one end, cut is in the middle. And what that does is it uses the lower number setting on here. And then grind just turns this into a normal face mask. So you can wear this and be grinding and making lots of sparks and protecting your face without the dimming capability. So that's good. Now we're going to look at this chart, because this is going to tell us what shade we should use. So we're not stick. We are mild steel MIG with argon. This is mild steel MIG with CO2. So we're somewhere in the middle. These are line up pretty well with each other. And then amps, uh, we'll just consider the worst situation, which is 135, which is the full capacity of our machines right about here. So it's saying 11, 12 is our setting. In general, you just want to protect your eyes as much as possible. But if you're set to 13 and you can't see anything, that's also no good. So you should consider 11 or 12 the minimum, but 13 might be more comfortable. And so that is where you should would go as long as you can still weld well. You want to make sure that all of your skin is covered, your face, neck, uh, make sure you're wearing closed-toed shoes. Again, you really don't want them to be synthetic. If you're wearing sneakers with a mesh on top, the slag could just melt right through that. Uh, so you probably should be wearing something that will not melt. And you really need to be wearing closed-toed shoes, 100%. You need to make sure that all the flammable, if you have like a roll of paper towels for cleaning the steel, make sure anything flammable is well out of the way. You don't want sparks flying and catching something on fire. Things like pockets and even like in here in the laces of your shoes can, get, can catch some slag that'll sit there and get hot. And the slag is just the, the melted metal. So now in terms of gases, we have a fume extractor over here. So the fume extractor is just a very localized source of fume extraction. So this whole room already has a really good airflow and conveniently it's located right above us. Um, you do want to make sure that when you're welding, this, this should be on whenever there are people in here, but um, just double check to make sure there's air flowing. And then this extracts the smoke directly from the source. Something that people do when they're not really thinking about it is they'll put their face right over the well directly into the flow of the smoke. You don't want to do that. Even with really good collection, 
you don't want to put yourself where you're breathing it in. So make sure to orient your, in, yourself in such a way so that you know this can turn. You can really get it. It's you can get it into most any position that you need. It'll reach clear across the room or this, this little area. The switch for this guy is right up on the wall. So you want to make sure to flip that on before you get started. Um, and then this is just to control the, the amount of airflow. So this is closed, this is open. In general, better just to leave it open. So in terms of metals, if you're welding stainless, you need to wear a respirator in addition. And as always, use the fume extractor. Galvanization on steel, when it's heated to the temperatures that the welding causes, the zinc comes off. And if you breathe that in, you're in for a really bad time. So you need, what you need to do is grind off any and all galvanization anywhere close to where you're welding. So uh, you may think you're welding right in this joint, but in reality, this whole area is getting very hot. In fact, it's called the heat affected zone. So you need to grind off any galvanization remotely in that area to make sure that you're safe. Um, and then, as always, fume extractor. Any other coating, paint, uh, chrome, like any other coating, you just want to grind off and have well away from where you're welding. That is the long and short of all the safety. And now we're actually going to get to the welding, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to put on the safety gear. I'm going to start with a jacket. And uh, in addition to the mask, you keep your safety glasses on, you know, because you're going to flip the mask up when you're trying to look at things and things can still be spattering. You, you know, don't want to be leaving your eyes unprotected. The pants are made out of cotton and the shoes are leather. So I think we're good in that department. Then I'm going to put a cap on. These just have a little bit of elastic, so they adapt to different head sizes. And I'm going to tuck the bill down into the collar of the shirt, grabbing a mask. So we set 11 or 12. I'm just going to set it to 13. There's no reason not to. Delay I'm going to put in the middle and sensitivity all the way up, making sure it's set to weld. On these, there are a bunch of different things you can, sorry, things you can change. I'm just going to try having it at the normal settings. This is just to tighten the head strap. So I'm going to put it over my head and then tighten it in the back so it's nice and snug. And then what you can do is raise it all the way up and tighten these guys on the side so that it doesn't fall down. And then it'll, so it clicks up when this is nice and snug. So now it's up and then it can come down. Um, and last, I'm going to grab some gloves from over here. We'll get more MIG specific welding for now, uh, gloves. For now, I'm going to use TIG gloves, which are fine. I'm just going to be very careful not to touch the work. I, I just grabbed another piece just because fitting up these two little guys was not just convenient. So I cleaned this one already. So I'm just going to clean a spot on here. So again, just grabbing a steel or a brush labeled for steel, cleaning some schmutz off of it. So I want a schmutzy weld and getting the grease off. Some people would say you want to degrease it first and then brush it because when you're brushing, you're just grinding the grease right into the metal. We're not building buildings here. It's called fit up is how good of a job you do getting them really close together. So here they're, they're pretty good. If you wanted it to be a really good weld, you could weld, uh, you could grind a bevel on this first. So you go over to the belt grinder and grind a, an angle on that. So your weld would sit really deep. Um, the penetration on this isn't incredible. So it's not going to blast its way all the way down there. So if you want that, you need to grind that down. Yeah. Conveniently for this weld, we have access to a lot of that surface. Something to note is that in general, you want to tack weld first. So a tack weld is just a little, just a little drop of weld holding it together. Um, and then that lets you, you can still kind of bend it a little bit and work it so that you can get it just exactly right and then go all the way around. It can be tempting to fill just every possible line of, of connection with weld. That doesn't necessarily make it that much stronger and it just takes a while, uses a lot of gas, uses a lot of metal and time. So uh, in general, you know, every, say if you're doing, like I was putting this table together, like every foot you want uh, maybe an inch or two of weld it doesn't, it doesn't need to be continuous all the way around. Um, you can see here the heat affected zone from welding underneath from that, that weld. 
the current was probably a little higher than it needed to be there. Uh, okay, so clean this guy. Doesn't look like you got that edge. I'm gonna clean this. And then we're gonna go through the steps. So we're gonna have this here. Um, I'm gonna use a magnet to hold them together. Just gonna clean some of the iron filings off of that guy. And these magnets just clink it right into place. They are really skookum. All right. Come on. All right. So, I mean, these, these magnets are really kicking, so it's kind of tricky to get it all lined up, but that looks pretty good. Um, all right. And now I'm just gonna clamp our work clamp right to the piece. So we have really good electrical connection. Um, that should be good. And if you wanted extra clamping power, you could take this guy, stick it here just so it extra doesn't move. This is a pretty serious clamp. We also have a lot of vice grips up on the wall by the entrance to the metal shop. So you could use those if you wanted uh, to clamp things down. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so now we're not going nowhere. Um, we have a really good fit up and we're clean and we're brushed. Looking pretty good. You can get the flammable things further away. Okie dokie. So we're gonna come over here and set up our settings. So gas is already on. Um, the flow is at zero. The reason that is, is because it's not letting gas through right now. So when you pull the trigger on the torch, two things happen. Um, three things happen, excuse me. So it lets gas start flowing. There's a, uh, a valve that gets turned on. Two, the electricity turns on. And three, that wire starts spooling out. So what we need to do when we're making sure the gas is at a good setting is turn this guy on. And then watch here as we pull the trigger. And we're sitting right at 20. So we want a little more flow than that. So turn that up. There we go. So we're sitting right at about 25 now. We've got this big long stick of wire. Um, so I'm going to put gloves on. I'm, I'm not pulling the trigger right now, obviously, but uh, still don't want to shock yourself, even though the electricity is coming from the plant. So we're going to grab these guys. So one of the many functionalities of these is they have snips in them. And if you have the snips on the far side, so right now they're on my, my right, they're on the far side from the camera, and you put it right up against here, it sets the proper stick out, which is about a centimeter. So now it's coming out the right length. Uh, you wanna do that pretty much every time you start a weld. So what happens is as you start welding, it leaves a little ball right at the tip. Um, and that may, is a bad way to start your weld because the electricity is kind of shooting out in every which direction. So every time you start, you just want to clip off the end. And when you're done welding, to be considered to the next person, you should just snip off the ends. They have a nice, nice start. Um, all right, so that's set. Our gas is set. So now we're going to look at the voltage and the speed. So we're doing eighth inch steel. So steel, check. CO2, argon, check. 0.03, check. And we're doing eighth inch, which is 0.125 eighth inch boom so it says we want a voltage of four and a speed of five to six cool um, the speed and the voltage come up together as you have more electricity it's going to melt that wire faster so you need it to come out faster so this is set to four this is set to five um five and a half see what happens so the speed is continuously variable the voltage clicks into certain positions when we're welding, there are a few things that we're gonna look for. One is there are different styles. So this is considered push welding, where you're going forwards and relative to your direction of travel, the torch is tilted backwards. So that'd be push, and then this would be pulling, where relative to your direction of travel, it's tilted towards it. Um, people have opinions, obviously, so many opinions. I think pushing is in general easier and better. I'm sure there are exceptions but it keeps your weld puddle or weld pool covered in gas. It's easier to see what you're doing. So we'll just, we'll just start there. In future classes, other teachers may have other opinions. 
the classic sound you're going for is the sound of crackling bacon, which is what they say. I don't cook a lot of bacon, so I don't really know what that sounds like. I think I have a vague idea. Um, but you get a sense for what doesn't sound good. For examples of what doesn't look good, we can look at this guy. So just to get a sense, let's see one that does look good. This is, this is okay. Uh, it, there's not great deposition. There should be more metal coming out. Um, there aren't actually many good ones on here. We should put one good one as an example. Most of these have, uh, they were either too far away, there wasn't enough gas, they didn't clean it well, there was too much wire and not enough voltage, and all those things result in really proud welds. These are beads just like sitting on the top, not doing anything. There's a little bit that's attached to the base metal or the parent metal underneath, but most of that filler is just sitting on top doing nothing. These at least have fused pretty well, so they're sitting down in there. But even that looks like there wasn't quite enough metal coming out. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all a balance, obviously. Um, luckily, you need to be certified to weld. So I'm not worried about anyone looking at this and then going and trying to put a bridge together. But you may be doing less intense things and you want to make sure you're getting a good weld. Uh, things that people get tested on when they're actual professional welders are the strength of the weld. So they'll take the piece of metal and try to bend it, try to break it, they'll cut it and see if, you know, if they're using x-ray to see if there are inclusions, to see if there's air pockets or pockets of slag from layers and layers of welding that have gotten built up. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a, a skill. And <laughs> this person didn't have much of it. <laughs> I hope no one was offended. I don't know who, who actually made this. Um, so cool. Um, I just noticed that this gripper on here, you could use it. This is really stuck to get this off. Some, some people will try to weld with one hand. Don't, don't do that. Two hands, you want to really have a nice fine control. Uh, in terms of the distance, you, you want to maintain a, about a centimeter distance, like about the stick out that this clipper sets, you want to maintain. So you want to stay that distance away. You want to push and go nice and even. You can weave going back and forth. You can go straight. In general, for something like this, we're trying to bridge a small gap. So what we want to do is go back and forth. We're going to start on one side and we're going to let the electricity heat up that piece of metal. And then we're going to go over and let that heat up and then back and forth. So we're just going to pause a little bit on each side just to let it really melt and get in there. In the middle, we're not melting anything except this teensy little piece of wire. So you don't need to hang out in the middle. It's on the sides where you want to hang out just a little bit so that the juice can flow through the, the metal and get it nice and red hot. They're all different kinds of, of shapes. People do C's and loop-de-loops and you can practice that all you want. So some of the things that we're gonna be looking for are you don't want a lot of sputtering. So here, I mean, sputtering will be like, you'll just see it spraying crap everywhere, excuse me. Um, here you can even see, oops, <laughs> there's, uh, this is a piece of the wire that just got stuck on and they blew through it here. They, they put a bevel, so they were, there's a bevel you can see on this piece of material which made it thinner there, but they didn't change their speed or voltage, so it just blasted through the piece of metal. Um, you can see here there's a piece of the wire sticking out. And then all these little, they're called BBs, like, like, oh, one just dropped right off. The BBs are the little just droplets of metal that spray and get stuck to things. So you don't want that. But you need to make sure your ground clamp is getting good conductivity. Uh, you need to make sure the gas is getting good coverage. Um, making sure you, your voltage is high enough that it's melting and not just blowing it around. If you're hearing like, if you're just hearing the, the wire being fed, then your voltage might be too high for the wire speed. So it's just, it's just melting it as soon as it's coming out. And so it's not even getting a chance to, to feed. So you just need to increase the speed a little bit. If your speed, if your, if your wire speed is too high, it'll be like as it's just trying to like shove metal in, but it's not melting fast enough. You don't want porosity, you don't want it to look like bubbly, because then you're, you check to make sure your gas is flowing, you haven't run out, make sure that everything's open. I am going to move this piece of paper. I'm gonna turn our fume extractor on. Woo. All right. So one test you can do is to look up at the light and your screen should dim when you look up at the light and that'll confirm to you that your shield is working. So we're gonna do 
is get set up. <clears throat> and it sounds pretty good. All right, so we can look at that now. And it looks to me uh, a few things. One, you can see this yellowish stuff. So over here, this is no good. This, this is porosity, holes, whatnot. So you should probably grind that back and, and redo it. There's also this, this yellowish stuff, um, which looks like it might have been a coating or something on here. But you would use a brush and scrape that off, especially if you wanted to do another layer on, on top. And it looks like the current could, was a little bit high. This just looks pretty flat. So I was going back and forth, but you can't really see any ridges. It's pretty smooth. I could either turn the wire speed up a little bit or the voltage down a little bit. That's the idea. You saw the tilting, you saw back and forth, and obviously I only raised the hood once it was done and once it cooled off a little bit. Um, the delay was already set in there. So you're obviously gonna shut off the welder. Turn that off. Uh, we're just gonna sort of loosely roll them up and hang it on here. Okay. Come on. All right, and then the work clamp. Um, as long as I'm doing this, I'll tell you just because I noticed on the material that steel changes color with different temperatures uh, and it does that around a heat affected zone and that's in the weld as well as at the heat affected zone the properties of the metal change and become pretty hard and brittle we'll just leave that there to cool these you can just kind of stick wherever they stick a uh, bunch of them are stuck here in terms of cleanup at the end you something that you can do especially if you just done a bunch of welding is cleaning up the inside of this nozzle so we covered that already, but you're just gonna grab these guys and use the outsides just to get out some of the schmutz. The next person has a less schmutzy weld. Put our pliers back there. This guy over here. And for this master, we'll go back up outside. The gas we need to turn off. That's a that's a big one. So we're gonna Turn this off here to purge the lines. So I'm just gonna turn this on for a minute. And you can see here that now all that gas is purged. Let me just snip off this guy. All right, so our tank is closed. The line is purged, and that's that's really a good habit to get into, for so that when you're doing oxyacetylene welding, your oxygen and acetylene lines are purged, and that's where it really matters. Fun fact: about 10 feet of oxyacetylene line, if they were to combine, would produce an equivalent energy as half a stick of dynamite. So, those you really want to purge. We're just going to obviously clean up the scraps, the little bits of wire we clipped off, um, and. That's how you MIG weld. Thanks for watching.